When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Did you see that at the very end of the reading? Verse 10. When Jesus entered the city, Jerusalem, it was stirred. It was stirred up. There's this uneasiness. There's this unsettledness in the city. Why? Because Jesus is there. And it, they're unsettled because they're asking this question. Who is this? Who is this? Now, maybe you've been um, coming to church for a while. I would put it to you that this passage is for you. Maybe this is super familiar to you. You've been to many services where you've heard this preached. My question for you is if, if this is familiar, is, is he stirring up your life today? That is the effect Jesus has wherever he goes. He is controversial. Is he stirring up your life? Maybe it's your first time to inspire. Maybe you are looking into Christian things. I would say this passage is for you because it gets to the heart of who Jesus really is. And the answer to this question, who is he, is the most important question you could ask in this life. Because the answer to that question has ramifications on all eternity. So today we're going to look at this question, who is this, according to Matthew. We're going to see first that Jesus answers it. Then secondly, we're going to see that the the crowd that's traveling with him, they answer it. And then we're going to ask, how do we answer that question personally? How do we respond to that? So let's look at the text, the very beginning together, verses 1 through 3, as Jesus begins to answer this question, not so much by what he says, but what he does. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them. And he will send them right away. So what's happening here? Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's got a crowd with him. In fact, many people were traveling to Jerusalem at this time because it is during the Passover, a major festival They're going there to celebrate the Passover when they remembered back to when God delivered them out of Egypt. He brought them out of slavery as a people and brought them to their promised land. So they're going to celebrate this. But unlike most people who are just going to celebrate the Passover, Jesus has another reason. He's on a mission. In fact, you see it here. He is orchestrating these events so that he comes into town riding on a donkey. That's not an accident. And it's not because he was tired that he chose to ride on a donkey. It's very specific, very intentional. So as we see Jesus unfold and who he is in this this passage, we're going to see that he's gentle, he's humble, but he's not being swept away by the crowds. It's not poor Jesus, look at him, they're leading him to his death. No, he is in control. Look at verse 3. He refers to himself as the Lord. So when his disciples go in to find a donkey for him to ride on, he says, if anyone asks why you need this or who needs it, say, the Lord needs it. The one who's orchestrating these events that is causing all of this to be. Jesus is clear about who he is. Now, as they are approaching, uh, they go into Bethpage, which is about a mile, less than a mile outside of Jerusalem. So this is the home stretch. And they're coming by the way of the Mount of Olives. And so geographically, this would be up on a hill that would be overlooking the city of Jerusalem, specifically the temple area. And they're they're coming down into the city, and there's this massive crowd beginning to follow and come in with him on their way into the city. And so his disciples go off, they get this donkey for him, and that's that's just an interesting thought. Like, why, why a donkey, of all things? You know, It's not because he's just weary from this long journey that they go to get him a donkey. There's a very specific reason, and it should catch our attention. Well, if you're wondering why that is, look at verse 4. Matthew answers this for us. It says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. So who is Jesus? He is the one who fulfills Scripture. By what he does... By his action, he is making a statement. And it's a statement that would be loud and clear to his audience. Because what this prophet, who this prophet is, this prophet is Zechariah. Look at verse 5. 
Zechariah says this in chapter 9, verse 9. If you would like to flip back in your Bibles, you can actually find it on page 955 if you'd like to read it for yourself, but Matthew quotes it for us here. He says, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Zechariah was written over 500 years before, and now Jesus is intentionally fulfilling this prophecy. Who was Zechariah really talking about here? Zechariah was talking about the messianic king, the king who would come, set up peace, and rule forever. This was the king, the Davidic king, that was first spoken of in 2 Samuel chapter 7, but promised all throughout the Old Testament. And now he's saying, Jesus is saying by his actions that I am he. Jesus wants to draw the connection between him and David, and he wants to make it absolutely clear that he is the Messiah that was promised. Now his listeners, this first century Jew, would have been very familiar with this passage in Zechariah. This isn't some obscure passage. For us, it seems a little obscure, like, oh, there's somebody riding on a donkey way back here, and that's related to Jesus. How? Well, this was a messianic promise that God was going to fulfill. And the Jews were looking for this to happen. They were waiting for this king, this redeemer, this savior that would come. And now Jesus, when he gets on this donkey and rides into Jerusalem, the crowds look at him and said, okay, I know what you're doing. I know this is it. The time is coming. And Jesus kickstarts these events that will accelerate over this course of this week that would lead to his death. The time has come. The time has come for him to announce to the world who he is. And he does it right here by riding into town on a donkey. Jesus claims to be the promised son of David. What about you? What do you make of this fulfillment of Scripture? Do you acknowledge Jesus, his, his claim to be king? Who do you say he is? Jesus' claim here is it's very controversial because you can't just do nothing with it. You have to acknowledge that he says he is the king of the world and that he's demanding that we follow him. I work with university students and I often have conversations, and many of them are not Christians. And many of them would say something along the lines with, I'm cool with Jesus. He did a lot of great things, good example to follow, said a lot of really good things. But the problem is that that is a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. If you really understand who he is, it, it should cause a stirring. It should stir things up because you can't just be cool with Jesus. You have to take him for who he is or reject him for who he says he is. Well, what type of king does Jesus claim to be? It's all there in verse 5. First, Jesus claims to be the king who comes to you. Think about that. The God of the universe coming to you, to enter into a relationship with you. It's not you going to him. It's not you seeking him out. This is the king who comes to you. He is the initiator. And here he comes into the city. He's on a mission. He's on a mission to give his life so that others might live through his death. He comes for you. Second, we see that he's a gentle king. He comes in gentleness. The king who has all power comes in gentleness. The king who created the entire world, and we've messed it up through sin and rebellion, shouldn't he come with an iron fist and say, clean, clean your act up? How does he come? He comes gentle, with gentleness. He's approachable. And then we see third that he's a humble king. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says that he comes lowly, riding on a donkey. Lowly means humble. He comes in humbleness. Jesus actually refers to himself this way. If you look at uh, chapter 20, verse 28, just on the same page there uh, that we're looking at, but chapter 20, verse 28, this was our, um, what we just read, the assurance of forgiveness. But this is how Jesus refers to himself. He says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve, humility, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The true picture of humility. Serving to the point of death. That's who this king is. Think about the great kings of the past. I don't know who comes to your mind, but do they match this description? Is their greatness won by coming peacefully, coming gently, coming humbly? I think of Alexander the Great, conquered much of the known world, but it wasn't through these means. He did it through war. 
There's never been a king like Jesus, and there never will be a king again like Jesus. And then lastly, what type of king is he? Who is he? He's the king of peace. How do we know this? Well, he comes riding on a donkey. The donkey was the symbol of peace. If a king came riding on a horse, it may mean war. But here he comes, riding on a donkey. He's declaring peace. God is going to make peace with man. Jesus is going to make the way that we can have peace with God. He comes peacefully. As Mark shared just a couple weeks ago during our um, series in Isaiah, speaking about Jesus, that one day he will return. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we get this picture of Jesus' return. How does he return? It's not on a donkey. It's on a horse. The picture that's painted, the imagery used in Revelation 19, is a bit terrifying. His eyes are blazing with fire. There's a sword coming out of his mouth. His robe is dipped in blood. He's coming to rid the earth of all injustice, all evil. And that should be terrifying unless you receive him when he comes in peace. Now is the time of peace. Receive him now. He's coming to you, gentle, humble. Who do you say he is? He comes bringing peace. Well, the crowd has an answer to this question too, this question of who is this. And uh, it is by their actions that they answer this question first and then with their words. So look at verse 8. Their actions are maybe a bit odd. There, it says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So first the crowd answers the question by saying that he is the king. He is their king because they spread their cloaks on the ground. So that is odd to me. Like I don't, That would not be my first instinct to honor somebody, just take my coat, get it dirty, just walk all over it. But there's precedent here because in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, when Jehu is newly anointed, the people lay their cloaks at his feet. And it was a sign of surrender. It was a sign saying, tread on me, walk on me. I'm putting myself under your authority. I'm laying my cloak at your feet. You are the king. Here's Jesus, the anointed king. The people respond appropriately because they recognize him for who he is. And then you get this a little bit about the palm branches. It actually just says tree branches here, but according to John's account, if you look at the book of John as he details this event, he says it's palm branches. Palm branches would be a nationalistic symbol for Israel, much like waving a flag. It would have been a symbol of victory. And so they're looking to Jesus, answering this question, who is this? And they're saying he's the one who brings victory. Jesus is the one who brings victory. That's what they're symbolizing with these palm trees as they lay out the red carpet, so to speak, for Jesus to enter in to Jerusalem. And again, from John's account of this story, we realize that they don't really understand what type of victory he's going to bring. They do recognize him to be the king, the Messiah. They got that right. They get who he is, but they just don't know how the events are going to unfold. And they say they don't really get it until Jesus was glorified, until he's crucified, resurrected, and then ascends to heaven. That's when they fully get it, as they look back. They thought he was bringing in a victory, a political victory. That he's going to come in. He's going to kick out the Romans who are occupying their territory. That he's going to give them freedom. He's going to restore Israel to its former glory. But what type of victory does Jesus bring? He actually brings victory through his death. When he dies on the cross, he actually brings victory over sin. So not just a political victory, but victory over sin itself. He absorbs the wrath of God on our behalf. And then when he rises from the dead, he's resurrected, he defeats death. He is victorious over death. So he brings about victory, for sure, just a different type that they were, than they were thinking at the moment. He is the one who brings victory. And then we see that they believe that he is the one who can save. That's who they say he is. He's the one who can save. How do we know this? Well, they're yelling. What are they saying? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. That word Hosanna is not something that we typically use in our everyday language. I'm sure you can count on one hand hand, how many times you've heard that at the office. Probably never. What Hosanna means, it means save. Oh, save. 
It can be a request, save us. And it can also be a declaration, you save. You are the Savior. And that's what they're doing here. They're praising him by yelling, Hosanna. And they're recognizing him as the one, the only one who can save. And then lastly, by their words, they call him the son of David, the promised one that would come from the line of David that they were anticipating and waiting for. He's the fulfillment. He's the long-awaited king. So the crowd of people walking with Jesus into Jerusalem declare him to be king by their actions and their words. So the question is, is this your posture towards Jesus, to lay your cloak at his feet, to come under his authority, under his leadership and rule? Well, what is our response to this question? What is your response to this question? Who is this? We all, do, we all have to do something with that. As I mentioned at the beginning, that is the most important question that we could answer in this life. And 2,000 years ago, they were asking this question when Jesus entered. And we're asking the same question today. Who is this man? So maybe you're sitting there and thinking, okay, maybe he is the king. Now, I, I get it. He claims to be that. But why should I surrender or give up control to him? And I would say it's because of the type of king he is. Gentle, lowly, humble, in control, savior, coming in peace. Because of who he is, that's why we should consider giving up control. The truth is we all give up control of our lives to something. We all have little kings, so to speak, in our lives. We're giving control and authority to something, but will that something bring you life in the end? Or does it bring destruction and death? Some examples might be, a relationship. And I would ask yourself the question, can this person love me with the selfless, sacrificial, perfect love that Jesus can? And they can't, because none of us can do that, right? But Jesus can. That's what he's offering. Come under his servant leadership. Maybe that little king in your life is money or success or pleasure The thing about money is it only demands more. (laughs) Money will never serve you. Same thing with success. It will not sacrifice itself for you. But yet it will demand more of you and may end in destroying you. Or pleasure is like a cup that has a hole on the bottom. You pour into it, you pour into it, it's just draining out the other end. Always needing to be refilled, this pursuit of pleasure. And Jesus offers pleasures forever in eternity with him. So the reason you should come to Jesus as king is because he comes to you gently offering peace. And his rule actually brings flourishing to your life and has the promise of eternal life. So maybe you're sitting there thinking, I agree, I've done that. I've actually been a Christian since I was little. I have surrendered to Jesus' authority. And I would say, amen, that's great. But the thing about the Christian life is that it's a journey and that we are continually bringing aspects of our life as God reveals it to us under his authority. So there is the moment when you're saying, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I surrender all. But then as you're following him, you realize, oh, I haven't surrendered at all. I need to surrender this area and this area to him. What are those areas for you? Is Jesus stirring up your life today? Here are some areas I was thinking through. Areas of finances, relationships, career, entertainment, and free time. Those are some ones that, as I was thinking through this, that I was challenged with. And uh, just take the first one there. Is Jesus king over your finances? One of my heroes in the faith is Frank Barker. He started the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America denomination in the U.S., and he just passed away just a few years ago. But there's a biography written about him, his life of just walking by faith. God did some amazing things in and through him. And uh, one of the things that was written about him is that he was giving away 70% of his income uh, at one point in his life. Now, that didn't just happen. He didn't just wake up and say, I'm going to give away over half of my income. And that's a radical thought. That, I mean, I don't even know how to get there, right? But the way it happened was little by little. I want to I surrender a little bit this year, a little bit more, a percent this year, a percent this year. That's challenging. How do I, how do I use God's money to his glory, for his glory? What about relationships? I was challenged with this, that when I walk into a room, what I'm thinking about 
is not the needs of everyone else. My eyes are usually on myself. And as I was reading um, in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about just putting others' needs above your own and looking to the example of Christ who humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. And I'm just like, wow, I don't do that. When I come home from work, from a busy day and I'm tired, I'm coming into my house, I'm not thinking, my first thought is not, how can I serve the needs of my children and my wife and make their life better at this moment? I'm thinking, I need a break. (laughs) And so I'm challenged by this. I want to grow in this area. What about the area of careers? Is Jesus king of your career? Now, I said I've worked with students, and I've worked with students for many, many years, and so I've seen people graduate and go all over the world to work. Um, and when I was going to, the, um, to school in the U.S., there was one guy that stood out in particular in this area of career, and he graduated, had job offers, lucrative offers, but he chose to stay in the city that he was going to school so that he could attend a church that he knew would be good for him and that he could be discipled. He could be built up. He knew he was a young Christian. He came to, be, he come to, he came to know Jesus towards the end of his uh, time in university. And he said, you know what? I need, to st- I need to be here so I can grow in my relationship with God. It's like, wow. That's a lordship decision. What about the area of entertainment? I have some family members right now that are doing a media fast. They've just recognized that what they're consuming, what they're bringing in is influencing the way they're thinking. And they want to put scripture in instead. And so they're taking a break from media. How do you do entertainment? What about free time? Again, thinking back uh, to my own experience in university, there was a guy who graduated and uh, was working in the city in which I was living. But in his free time, in the evenings, he would come to campus. He would share the good news of Jesus with people who didn't know him. And he'd help disciple those who were young in their faith. Had an impact on my life. Just thinking about, he didn't have to do that. He was tired from a long day's work. How was he going to invest his life? How is he going to use his free time? That's challenging. What does that mean for you? What area, and this is not a comprehensive list, right? But what area is God putting his finger on in your life? What area do you want to surrender under his lordship today? And then last but not least, we can't lose sight of this. I think Maybe the primary application is worship. Let's join in with these people, this crowd, as they honor the king, as they come into Jerusalem, and they yell, they proclaim, Hosanna. They're praising his name. They're calling him the son of David, the king, the promised one. You've come. Our hearts should be overflowing with praise because of what Jesus has done. So let us apply that today as we leave, that we would look to him as king, that we'd surrender our lives to him, and we'd worship him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this picture of Jesus entering in, coming to us. He is the ultimate picture of humility and gentleness, yet power. He's in control. He knows what he's doing, and he's doing it for us. God, may we come to you while there's time, this time of peace. We praise you for what you've done. We thank you that you are the almighty God and that we can know you. We can have a relationship with you. Praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.